I would like to present our next speaker, Phil Reeves. Okay. And Phil is Vice President of Strategic Consulting within Stratasys in the UK. And uh, you need a computer. Yeah. The computer is gone. The computer is gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's somewhere. Oh, there it is. Hey, that's better. Um, <laughs> okay. And Phil will talk about how companies are using 3D printing to respond to global socioeconomic megatrends. Please. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the, uh, the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to come over. Um, just as way of introduction, so um, as I was introduced, I'm Vice President of Consulting in Stratasys. Um, for those of you not familiar with, with Stratasys, uh, we're the, I guess the leading 3D printing company globally. What I do in the company is run the consulting division. So we're all about solutions. We're all about helping companies understand how to embed this technology into their value chain how to understand how to make a business case for using 3D printing. So, you know, why are we all here? I guess everyone's here because they've seen all of these, these articles, um, all of this, I'm not going to call it propaganda, but I'm certainly going to call it hype. You know, you read some of these comments about new industrial revolutions and printing Stradivariuses and inventing the future, and, you know, additive goes mainstream, and, 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 and the premise is that everything is going to change in society. And there's a new industrial revolution. Yeah, and that's, that's the message that, unfortunately, our industry has been pushing for, for maybe the last five to ten years. I'm not sure it's necessarily that true. Because the reality is, as Olaf kindly pointed out, all we're talking about is making things in layers. That's it. That's the fundamental change. We used to make things by subtractive or formative or fabricating. Now we make it in layers. Is that really so profound? Is that really going to change economies and reshore manufacturing from low-wage economies? Is it, is it that important? There's some interesting stats that go behind some of these claims. There's some quite big numbers being thrown about. You know, people like McKinsey are saying that this will be a $200 billion industry by 2025. If you pin McKinsey down, they won't tell you how they came to that number or how they make it up. I would love it to be $200 billion of machine sales, but it isn't. It's $200 billion of product. The global aerospace industry is worth $660 billion a year. So put these things into context. Is it a big number? Is it not a big number? It's a bigger number than the number we have today. But there is growth. I think the, <laughs> the key thing here to consider, and when you sit back and you think about this as a realist and sit in a, in a, in a cold room in your garden and think, well, how the heck are we going to get to $200 billion from where we are today? There's only two ways. One is doing what we do now, which is looking for what we would call low-hanging fruit, looking for a business application that fits the technology we have. Because you know, don't, do not elude yourself. There have been no new 3D printing technologies for 20 years. They're all fundamentally the same concept of powders and extrusion and laser beams and electron beams. And, and as Olaf showed us, hearing aids and dental aligners, they've all found an application. They've all found a technology that works. And then there are billions of other manufacturing applications that don't work. And that's really the second reason, because we've never made technology to fit the product. And this is my big contention between what we call rapid prototyping and additive manufacturing. My company makes rapid prototyping machines, and they are universally flexible. Because today they have to make one product, and tomorrow they have to make another. Yeah, if I run a car factory, if I make aerospace ducting, or I make a certain component part in a medical device, I do that today, and I do it tomorrow, and I do it the day after and the day after. The geometry might be different, but my market is the same. The bounding box of my part is the same. But to this point in time, we've never innovated technologies to fit products and business cases. That, to some degree, is where the industry is shifting. So we as a company have said that we're making a concerted effort to become a solutions company, not someone who just sells machines. So show us what the machine needs to do. We innovate the technology for the application. That's how we get to $200 billion. But, but why do we need to do that? Why do we need more technologies? You know, we've got to 2015 with machining and casting and, and injection molding. Why? Why do we need this new approach? And I think, you know, this, this seminar was about society. So I, I kind of thought, well, okay, what, what is it? What's changing? And, and of course, this is nothing new. Society's been changing ever since society started. But the big megatrends that, that we're seeing impacting 
on, on us as, as, as individuals and consumers and patients. You know, the societal changes, aging populations, changing birth rates, millennialism, millennium babies. You know, there's a, there's a huge change, a societal change. Culture and connectivity. Ten years ago, we would not have conceived the way that culture is driven by connectivity. How Twitter and Facebook and everything that connects us and drives our purchasing patterns has changed. The environment, of course, is a huge issue. And it's becoming more of an issue. Uh, I, was, I was in the States last week with a cosmetics company and their biggest drivers for the future are actually about the impact of pollution on the skin. That's what's driving their company's roadmap. And the economy, globalization. We live in this enormously globalized, changing world. The economy moves around. That's what we're faced with as, as manufacturers. I showed you some of those covers of magazines earlier because we've been talking about industrial revolutions, and I'm not quite sure journalists really understand what the triggers were to genuine industrial revolution. You know, if you, if you follow some of these back, you know, the original industrial revolution, 1760, Richard Arkwright in Cromford, harnessing the power of water to mechanize it, that was a revolution, taking human muscle power away and replacing it with the energy of another, another force, a motive force, and it was water. You know, the second industrial revolution we forget about was actually a materials revolution. It was about the Bessemer steel process. It was a way of consistently making good quality material that we could then, following on from one of the questions earlier, we could design around. Because until that point, we had no consistent mechanical properties. You know, and then we had this, this third industrial revolution, the, the digital and the communications revolution. And, and you know, those together are being cited as a third industrial revolution. Is 3D printing a fourth industrial revolution? I don't think it's impactful enough to be thought of on its own. So, just going back to the revolution, where did you guys, what did you achieve? You know, I was looking last night and thinking, Sweden, I don't know a great deal about Sweden, it's a lovely country, and I've spent some time with Lars in Ostersund, getting very cold. Um, but the three-point seatbelt, that's pretty important. That's been driven by societal need enormously to reduce accidents and reduce death, and I'm sure was driven to some degree by, by changes in legislation. The pacemaker, again, incredible innovation. You know, that's at the cusp of materials. It's at the cusp of digital. Um, the zipper, I didn't realize the zipper came from Sweden. It's an interesting one. Again, what was that about? How, how did that respond to a societal need? What was it? What was that societal need that people said, actually, I don't want to tie up pieces of lace anymore. I want to zip things up. The safety match, obvious societal need. I don't want my children setting fire to my house. Tetra Pak, that's an interesting one. There's lots of arguments about was that environmental, was it social? Is it better than having glass, having waxed paper? What's the driver? And then the modern ones, Spotify, Skype. You know, Spotify is, is really interesting, responding to a change in culture, the way that we access digital data. Skype, the way that we communicate. So I wanted to put this in here, because I'm going to come on my very last slide back to where you are today, according to the OECD. So industrial revolutions. There is a fourth industrial revolution. Um, and it was first postulated about four years ago by the German government. And the German government believes that we are at the cusp of a fourth industrial revolution, and it's called Industry 4.0. The idea here is that we take everything that came before, but we include the consumer, and we include the connected supply chain. So we now live in a world where I have a device in my hand that fundamentally can, can control what happens in a factory. And what happens in a factory can control what happens in a logistics warehouse that can fundamentally control how something comes back to me. And that's a closed-loop manufacturing cycle. And that's Industry 4.0. So you know, the wording is a little convoluted. It's connecting the value chain, cyber-physical production systems. It's connecting the whole supply chain from designing to making to consuming. And that's where we are in society. We think 3D printing sits really quite neatly in that supply chain because it's one of the few technologies that allows us to be flexible enough to respond to the changing needs of consumers. But we need to integrate it with lots and lots of other technologies, software tools, and that's one of the things we're doing a lot of work on with people like Cisco and SAP and the, and the robot manufacturing companies to understand how do we genuinely integrate 3D printing into a factory environment. So, if you look at 4.0, we, we call this the Reeves Continuum in our office. So, 
whether this is true or not, I'm not sure, but we believe that there are, there, are two, there are two interplays going on here. You've got manufacturers, retailers, and brands, and you've got consumers. And at one end, you've got companies that make everything to stock and consumers who buy everything on demand. And at the other end, you have brands that make nothing and consumers who want to make everything. And every company sits along there somewhere. Maybe you're in the middle where you're a consumer who wants to personalize everything, but you accept that a manufacturing company will make it for you. Okay? And that bit in the middle is really the space for the Industrial Revolution. It's the space for companies to decide where do they want to sit. So, just going back, and, and Olaf sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, about this, this use of two terms. People talk about 3D printing, and they talk about additive manufacturing. And some people use it interchangeably. I don't know if I'm on a one-man crusade to try to stop that, but I think there is a difference, a fundamental difference. And that is that 3D printing is where consumers are the manufacturer, and additive manufacturing is where layer technology sits in an existing supply chain. And they are two very, very different value chains. So I want to take you through them both. And I'll start with, if we can get the tech to work, we'll start with consumer 3D printing, because we haven't talked a little much about this. Thing to note about consumer 3D printing, relatively new concept, about 2009, open source project, lots of open source innovation. Um, what have we seen in consumer 3D printing? An enormous growth in technology capability. It is amazing how good people who don't work for companies are at doing innovation. Point number one. Whether it's because they're more motivated, or whether they don't... I don't know. I don't know what it is. But I'll be honest, the amount of innovation that we've seen in crowdsourced, kickstarted, collaborative ventures has been absolutely astounding. Um, if you take MakerBot as a company, you know, they started in 2007, basically taking designs off the internet. And by 2009, they modified those designs somewhat. Um, 2010, they were offering a kit for 3D printing. So it used to be that you went on the internet, and you sourced all the component parts yourself, and then you got them from Amazon and eBay, and a week later, you had this pile of bits, and then you download the design file, and it tells you how to assemble it, and then you download the firmware, and hopefully it all works. MakerBot said, no, 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 I'll tell you what, we'll sell you all the component parts, you can build it yourself. And interestingly, they then very quickly realized that people didn't want to do that. They weren't interested in building the machine, they were interested in using the machine to print objects. So they stopped selling kits and started selling machines. And then they started fielding all the queries and the questions about, well, it's not very automated and it's not very intelligent. To the point where we now have machines that are self uh, self-regulating, I'll come on to it in a minute in terms of the, 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 the control systems in them. Another ob observation, you know, one of the barriers that people have put up to consumer 3D printing, it will never happen, it's too expensive. I've just bought one of these. Um, $349, that's less than I paid for my son's Xbox. So, so, that, so the idea and the argument that 3D printers are too expensive to be consumer devices is, is nonsensical. Come on to this, they're also intelligent. They've become Internet of Things addressable objects. So the current MakerBot has build status monitoring. It has cameras embedded in it. It has performance monitoring. It knows how much raw material is left. It sends me packet data to my phone to tell me it's finished, or do I want to start the next build, or it tells me that the material's run out, and if I want to go into the office, there's 20 hours of build time left. It also tells me there's 15 minutes of build time left, so don't bother wasting your time coming and filling me up. Industrial additive manufacturing machines don't do that, but consumer printers do. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the consumer printers are driving this industry to some degree. What we're also seeing through this Internet of Things approach is that machines are coming addressable. And again, come back to Spotify here. So I'm sure we're going to hear, hear a little bit about this in the session on IP later, but one of the big concerns, certainly from brands, is... I don't want to make my data available to somebody to print because I'll lose control of my data. And it will be put on Pirate Bay and it will be shared and everything will be out in the world. Well, actually, we don't need to think in that context. You know, the music industry and the film industry have driven us our psychology to think like that. And the reason the music industry and the film industry has had to change is because at the time, 
we were copying files and streaming, uh, sorry, and, and downloading from, from BitTorrents, we didn't all have broadband. We now all have broadband. We actually can download data quicker than we can use it. So all of a sudden, we don't need to download data to print it. I can stream data and print it. I never need to see the data. So I can protect the data. I'll give you the bits that you need just at the point in time when your printer's ready. And if your printer fails, well, it can tell me it's failed and it can start again. But when you've got your object that you paid for, you have your object, you don't have the data. That's a business model that's already being developed by a number of companies like Authentize and PrintShield. So we've got low-cost consumer 3D printers that are internet addressable that we can download data and stream to them. OK. How prevalent are these things? There's about 200,000 consumer 3D printers in the world. This is one of my favorite companies. These guys are literally just across the water in Amsterdam. 3D Hubs started two or three years ago with, with a vision. Their vision was to network consumer 3D printers together to make the world's biggest factory. And that's exactly what they've done. So I checked this morning, there were 23,434 printers on this network. Yeah, that's a virtual factory. I checked a bit more, um, and I put the, post, uh, the postal address in for this building. Uh, and what you'll see is that um, Alex at the top there actually has a hub that's 1.4 miles away from here. So actually, there's a 3D printing factory that I can get to now on my mobile phone to get things printed. It's 1.4 miles away. Alex will ship it to me. I can go and pick it up from his house. If I can't do the CAD, he will do the CAD because he offers modeling. Uh, and he can get it to me in three days. Yeah, 24,000 of those people around the world. Society is becoming the manufacturer. So how are we responding as industrialists? Some smart companies are already starting to understand this. Fairphone is a great example. So Fairphone are a company who, um, they're challenging the kind of mindset of Apple and, and Samsung and saying, why, why do we as consumers not get true visibility of the objects we buy? Why is there a shroud of mystery around the cost and the bill of materials? Why won't Apple tell us what the chip costs or the assembly? Why are they scared and frightened to share that? So Fairphone's model is a totally different business model. It says we will tell everybody what our bill of materials is and our R&D costs and our assembly costs and our profit margins. And we'll make it fair and equitable. And you can see, and if you like that concept, then you can buy our product. And if you buy a Fairphone, which are launched this year, it comes with a link to the 3D Hubs website, where you can go one step further. You can get your cases printed on 3D Hubs locally, and it will equally show you how much the 3D Hubs get. How much does the guy down the road get paid? Because these people making parts at home are getting paid. They're actually recouping the investment they made in their 3D printers. <laughs> They're amortizing their investments. That's a, a really unique business model. You know, none of us did that with our 2D inkjet printers. So this is the way that the home industry is emerging. Of course, it does have its problems. You know, not everything is perfect. You know, I'm, I'm an engineer and a realist. Sometimes things look like that. Okay, that's what comes off consumer 3D printers. So if consumer 3D printing is limited, then what about industrial additive manufacturing? And, and Olaf's talked a, a bit about this earlier. Um, we as a company think that there are, there are six fundamental business reasons why companies should investigate using 3D printing. And if you can't match your business to one of these six, then it isn't really applicable. There is no reason to investigate it. So it's about economic low volume production. You know, if your business is in mass production of low cost products, then this technology is not for you. Increased product complexity, as we've, we've seen earlier, you know, this idea of geometric complexity for free. You know, it's a very difficult concept, this concept that we are dislocating the complexity and the price. Because in most manufacturing processes, the more complex the geometry, the more expensive. Um, product personalization, which we will come on to. Product personalization is really the coupling of, of complex parts and low volume. You know, we're 9 billion people, we're all a different size and shape. You know, that's, that's the, the, res, the net effect of low volume economic production. Part functionality, I'll give you some examples. Environment and optimizing the supply chain. You know, the companies that we work with are all striving to use 3D printing to address one or more of those different drivers. So as we've seen, 
this idea of low volume, you know, what, what do we mean? Well, we actually mean applications where we can reduce fixed assets and replace fixed assets, eliminate tooling. You know, there will always be injection mold tooling, as we've, we've heard already, high volume mass manufacture. But what we're seeing as, as the cost of, of additive technology comes down and the productivity goes up, the number of parts we can make cost effectively before it's worth investing in tooling is going up and up and up and up. So if we went back 10 years, it might be 10 parts. Five years, it was 100 parts. Last year, it may have been 10 parts. You know, I've seen technologies and laboratories that are 20 times faster than today's fastest 3D printing tech. All of a sudden, we're starting to get down into the realms of injection molding. So that opens up huge opportunity. There are other reasons, though. Reducing capital, investment, and inventory. You know, we've done some work with people on, on the whole innovation process and saying, if you didn't spend a million dollars on investment, invest on tooling, what would you spend the million dollars on? How do you generate wealth by freeing up working capital? Simplifying the supply chain, as we've heard, you know, reducing lead times, there's a huge amount of cost tied up in supply chains. Mitigating risk, speed in the innovation cycle. Design complexity, um, as, as Olaf said, you know, it's all about making the things that we can't make traditionally. Re-entering features, complex honeycombs, consolidating assemblies. That's a driver. Personalization. Um, I think there are two types of personalization, and we, we get a little bit confused with this. Uh, and, and we need to start talking about them slightly differently. There are products like the Invisalign dental aligner that are personalized by the nature that they fit the consumer. Okay, but the consumers had nothing to do with their design, apart from being the thing that has been designed around. The person has been scanned. That's a type of personalization. Another type of personalization is the toys and the dolls, where I go onto the internet and I become the designer. And I'm having an input on the design process using what's in here, not what's around me in terms of my body shape. And they're two very, very different value chains for different types of companies. So we're seeing lots of things. Medical devices is very prevalent. Cultural emotional icons and artifacts. And, and co-creation, which I know Ian's going to talk about later, this idea of who is the designer anymore? You know, is, is it the guy in the, in the office or is it the consumer at home? Who does it? Part functionality um, is worth bringing up. This is something that a lot of companies are striving to, to exploit. This idea that with 3D printing, additive manufacturing, we can add more value than just a geometry. So a good example of this is some of the, the things we've seen on orthopedic implants, where if you look at the traditional uh, supply chain for an implant uh, and map it out from a cost engineering perspective, if you look at acetabular cups, the most expensive part of making the hip implant isn't the metal drop forging. It's not the CNC machining. It's putting the physical vapor deposition ceramic coating on the surface that the bone grows into. So actually, if I'm using 3D printing, the first thing I want to focus on is, can I get rid of the ceramic coating? So in the case of hip implants, I can, by putting a surface texture onto the 3D printed part. So all of a sudden, I've displaced a very expensive part of the supply chain. Now, you could argue I've replaced another cheap part with an expensive part, but, but that's the importance here of looking across the whole supply chain. You know, the other things that we're now seeing is embedding secondary materials, secondary elements, putting electronics into parts, this idea of grading multiple materials, which I know you've been looking at for, for many, many years. You know, why, why do we have to think in a homogeneous material? You know, the inside of a shaft can have a certain torsion, but the surface of a part might give us wear resistance. You know, we can start to think differently about materials. They don't have to necessarily be homogeneous. The life cycle, um, Olaf touched on this again. This is a really important driver on many, many levels. You know, your, your, your bottle opener is a great example, but the 90% 90, the 90 benefit was a materials benefit. You know, so actually we have a raw material benefit here. Are there any materials companies in the room? Because they really don't like hearing about this. Okay, we don't necessarily need as much of it anymore. Um, and that's one of the benefits here. You know, if we're not taking huge billets of material and then having to, to, to machine them and then downcycle them. Um, the other thing is optimizing efficiency. This is a benefit of the design flexibility. So if you talk to GE about these engine components, the benefit to them is actually in the efficiency they get. So this component part, yes, it's made in one component. Uh, it's very, very expensive compared to an investment casting. 
But what it gives them is an efficient engine. You know, 40% or 25% efficiency in the engine. They're going to pass that on to their customers, and they're going to pass it on as an increase in price. So if I'm going to save you 25% over the next 30 years on my engine, I'm going to charge you more for it. And you're going to pay for it. And I can tell you what, what they're charging for the engine is significantly more than the increase in the cost of the parts. So again, looking at the value add in the, in the overall supply chain. And then the one that, that, that I love and we get very involved in in the office and get very emotional about is new supply chains, whole new models. You know, if we can displace these parts of the, of the supply chain, can we genuinely look differently? You know, Olaf showed a great slide, his last slide, about the, the change. Yeah, well, the change is happening. This is a company that, that, that we work with that uses our, our machines. They have a factory in the middle of Manhattan, most expensive real estate in North America. Why would you put a factory in North America in Manhattan? They've done it because actually most of their custom comes off the internet. But having a walk-in facility gives them an enormous amount of marketing capability. So what these guys do, let me explain the, the business case. So this is a company called Normal. And if you go on your phone and download the Normal app on an iPhone or an Android phone, you photograph your ear, put a Swedish krona next to it, okay, and send them the photograph. And they'll go online and find out what the size of a Swedish krona is. And hey, presto, they've got a datum. And then from your photo, they use software to extract the geometry of your ear. And then they put that into their CAD, and that's what becomes your in-ear headphone. And what's really neat, the packaging is beautiful for this, because they use the same data to print the packaging in 3D. So you get a premier product back. The quickest we've seen them do it so far is two hours. So if you walk in and get scanned, you can walk out two hours later, or go and have a cup of coffee, and you've got a product. That's a totally different business model. Most of their revenue comes from their internet sales through their app, but all of their production is done in Manhattan, where you can walk in, and that's where their brand is built from, the fact that it is built in a factory in Manhattan. So, you know, we're in this position where we've got distributed manufacture. This is a demand pool business model. Yes, they have to make a capital investment, but they have very low amounts of stock, and the stock they do have is relatively low-value components. You know, we're moving towards this idea of stockless supply chains or, or even chainless supply chains. Um, so, yeah, it's all happening today. That's, that's the realities here. So just to summarize, you know, 3D printing, industrial additive manufacturing, they are disrupting businesses without a shadow of a doubt, but they're enabling other opportunities and they're responding to changes in society. Um, I think they will play a really important role in this idea of Industry 4.0, and they will have a really profound impact on individuals, whether we're consumers or patients or people within manufacturing or retail or society. You know, this technology cuts across many, many different aspects, and that's the sorts of changes. So what does it mean for you guys? Well, it's a mid-sized country, 42nd richest based on GDP, 26th richest per capita, that's interesting, 163 billion of exports and 151 billion of imports, so you're a net exporter. So what are you going to net export that's 3D printed? Or what are you going to offset internally of that 151 billion that you import? So you're going to create wealth that way. Some interesting stats, 87 million internet users out of 9, 10 million people, and 12 million mobile devices. So there's more than one mobile device per person in Sweden. And I've been talking about apps and integration and, and driving the manufacturing supply chain using mobile phones. Oh, and you've got a very high density of uptake. Interestingly, 85% of you live in cities and urban areas already. So you can drive a manufacturing economy around urban areas just like normal are doing in New York. High life expectancy, a lot of millennials in this country, a lot of people who already think about apps and Facebook and Twitter and changing the way that they consume. But on the downside, that's quite high unemployment, and that astonished me. Um, but if you have an argument, take it up with the CIA, because that's where I get all my stats from. Um, so, just to conclude, where do you want to be? Where should this country sit along that continuum? Is it all about consumers making products, or about industry selling 3D printed products? And with that, I'm going to finish off. If we've got any time for questions, I'll take them. If not, I'm going to be around for the rest of the day. So. Okay, good. So, any questions? Please. Ingmar Wistrand, uh, Swedish Patents and Registrations Office. Uh, I was 
uh, had a question with regards to the largest manufacturing company, the Hub. I'm not sure. 3D that. Hubs. Yeah. Uh -huh. Have there been any controversies with regards to IP rights infringement of designs or? Uh, to my knowledge, but, no. But, but it's, it's, I mean, it's a very, it's a very valid question. And at the moment, within 3D Hubs, they have a, a ULA that says you must not infringe IP by uploading. Um, I don't believe they are actively monitoring. And you know, we've we've looked at this with all of the online 3D printing companies. They tend to wait wait until there's a takedown notice. But whether somebody is uploading a file, having it printed locally, going and getting it and then that data disappearing and that file being infringed, an infringement of IP, I've not heard of any cases of that happening. But the way 3D Hubs works, you have two ULAs. You have the person uploading and you have the person producing. Now, the person producing is the one who's told not to print things that appear to be an infringement of IP. But again, that's the gray area. What is an appearance of infringement? So, yeah, th there's... there's been some work, and we, we did some work a couple of years ago trying to look at whether you can analyze an STL file to work out whether it is an infringement of existing IP. But you are, you know, we are decades away from having that level of computer science. So it's, it's governed by user agreements, not by, by science or rigor. More questions? Yes, there. Please. Ola Lundström from the Swedish National Board of Trade. Uh, I can see I have the same question as the, the last question, but you can look at a lot of things, not only IP rights, but also product regulations. And what if I print out uh, Lego toys based on that? You have the IP for the Lego, mm -hmm. but the plastics might be poisonous as well. Yep. And I give them to my kids to chew on. And you turn the you turn the product chain upside down when you turn the consumer into a manufacturer mm -hmm. and the liability of the good is, is yep. very interesting in that instance. Yeah, and, and I think the answer um, and whether the, whether the lawyers or all the control freaks like it or not, the, the answer is common sense. Um, I think I'm a pretty good cook and one of the metrics of being a pretty good cook is I know what is edible. Yeah, I'm in a kitchen where I have bleach, I have washing up liquid, I have window cleaner, I have really aggressive stuff that I clean my cooker with. I never put it in my food. So I think you, you know, we, have to, we have to take this approach of saying we have to apply sense and logic. I'm not going to print... Yes, I, and I, I, oh, okay, there are issues about CE marking. Except in America. Okay, yeah, where you, you, yeah you'd probably... Eat, yeah, okay, let's not go there. But no, I, I, it's, it's a very, very valid point where... Yes, who is liable? I mean, that's one of the most important things here. If I upload data, but the data is corrupt, or the design file was a poor design file, and then the product fails, am I liable? If someone prints it out for me using the wrong material, are they liable, or is the machine vendor liable for allowing that machine to take the wrong material? So, you know, there's, there's lots and lots of people around the world thinking about all of these different permutations, um, and some are going about it in a very constrained way, and some of them are going about it I suppose in 3, 3D hubs, as an example, in a very maverick, wild west way, um, that's innovation. So, um, I don't, you know, there is no answer to the, to, to, to the conundrum. We cannot do it, but we get nowhere. Thank you, Phil. Okay, no problem. Thank you.